Today, we talk about one of the most controversial men in American history, Jefferson Davis. This is our second biography special episode to help us provide some flavor and context to our regular episodes following the war. As we talk about Davis's life before the war, please leave a comment below with your thoughts on the man. I would love to hear from you. I am Brendan Forrest, and this is Civil War. Jefferson Finnis Davis was born June 3, 1808, in Fairview, Kentucky. He was the youngest child of 10 to Samuel Emery Davis, a semi-prosperous farmer, and his wife Jane. Samuel had great admiration for Thomas Jefferson and named his youngest son after him. There was a large age gap of 23 years between the oldest son, Joseph Emery Davis, and Jefferson. Semi-fun fact, Davis and Lincoln were born less than eight months and 100 miles apart from each other. Davis's grandparents hailed from Great Britain and immigrated to North America in the early 18th century. His father Samuel was born in 1756 and served in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. Samuel married Jane in 1783 after the war's conclusion and the family moved to Kentucky in 1793. The Davis family moved twice during Jefferson's childhood, first to Louisiana and then less than a year later to Mississippi. He had three older brothers serve in the War of 1812. When Jefferson was 16 years old, his father Samuel died. His older brother Joseph stepped in and acting as Jefferson's surrogate father, encouraged him in his education. This is what Jefferson Davis's education looked like. So first, he went to Catholic school where he was the only Protestant in attendance. Next, he went to Jefferson College and finally he went to Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky. Understand though, that although called colleges and universities, these schools were more equivalent to high schools as they were in essence academies. Joseph Davis arranged for his little brother Jefferson to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1824. Davis, class of 1828, graduated 23 of 33. His rank was due in part to some shenanigans he got into in 1826. Davis served time in house arrest due to his involvement in the eggnog riot. More than one third of the cadets were implicated after having snuck whiskey into the academy during Christmas of that year, presumably to spike their eggnog. After graduating from West Point, 2nd Lieutenant Davis reported to the 1st Infantry Regiment at Fort Crawford in the Michigan Territory. His commander was the future president of the United States, Zachary Taylor. After a few years in March 1832, Davis took leave for the first time since commissioning, returning home to Mississippi. He was still at home when the short Black Hawk War occurred. Upon his return to the first, he escorted the Native American chief Black Hawk to prison. Davis did what he could to shield Black Hawk from curiosity seekers, and the chief noted in his own autobiography that Davis treated him with much kindness. Davis fell in love with Sarah Knox Taylor, the daughter of his commanding officer, and future President Zachary Taylor. Together, they asked for permission to marry. Taylor refused. Taylor knew a military's wife's life would be difficult on the frontier, and it was not the life he wanted for his daughter. After consulting with his brother Joseph, Davis decided to resign his commission. Without telling Taylor of his intentions, he married Sarah on June 17th against his former commander's wishes, and his resignation became effective June 30th, 1835. Joseph Davis became extremely successful owning hurricane plantations south of Vicksburg, Mississippi. His plantation was big, encompassing 1,800 acres along the Mississippi River. Desiring Jefferson to live close by, Joseph allowed Jefferson to develop Briarfield Plantation. Joseph retained the title to the land. In August of 1835, Jefferson and Sarah traveled to Locust Grove, his sister Anna's plantation in Louisiana. They planned to spend the hot summer months away from the floodplains of Mississippi for their health. Ironically, the couple was stricken with malaria soon after arrival. Sarah, Jefferson's new wife, died at the age of 21 after only three months of marriage. It would take Jefferson months to recover, and he would suffer poor health for the rest of his life. He suffered from recurrent bouts of malaria, battle wounds from the Mexican-American War, a chronic eye infection, and a nerve disorder that caused intense pain in his face. In late 1835, Jefferson Davis sailed to Havana, Cuba to recover his strength after his bout of malaria. While there, he observed the Spanish military and sketched their fortifications. The Spanish authorities, knowing his status as a former army officer, warned him to stop his observations. He soon became bored and returned home taking a circuitous route, visiting New York, then a friend in Washington, D.C. before returning home. Davis spent the next years developing his Briarfield plantation. He started the plantation with one slave named Pemberton. By the time of the Civil War, he promoted Pemberton to plantation overseer in charge of 113 slaves. Davis's political career began in 1840. In this year, Davis attended his first Democratic Party meeting in Vicksburg. 
The members surprised Davis, choosing him to be the delegate to the party state convention in Jackson. He attended the convention again in 1842, and by 1843, he was a Democratic candidate for the Mississippi House of Representatives for Warren County, Vicksburg's district. He lost his first race. He was one of six presidential electors for the 1844 election when he campaigned effectively throughout the state for the Democratic candidate James K. Polk. Jefferson Davis met Verena Banks Howell in 1844. Joseph Davis invited her to stay at his plantation for the year's Christmas season. Within months of meeting, the 35-year-old Jefferson and 18-year-old Verena married. This was despite her parents' concern about Jefferson's age as well as his politics. He ran again in 1845, this time as a candidate for the United States House of Representatives. He won and entered the 29th Congress. Jefferson and his second wife had six children. Three died before reaching adulthood. His daughter Margaret Howell was born in 1855 and became the only one of his children to marry and raise a family. In 1846, Jefferson Davis raised the Mississippi Rifles Volunteer Regiment to fight in the Mexican-American War. He became colonel under the command of his former father-in-law, General Zachary Taylor. The regiment sailed July 21st for Texas. Davis desired to arm his regiment with a new M1841 Mississippi rifle. He obtained a promise for the weapons from President Polk if Davis were to stay in Congress long enough to take an important vote on the Walker Tariff. He cashed that promise in, and his unit received the weapons. They also took the Mississippi Rifles name, as they were the first unit to be fully armed with these weapons. Davis participated in the Battle of Monterey in September 1846. He led a successful charge on the La Teneria Fort. He officially resigned his seat from the House of Representatives a month later on October 28th. He fought bravely on February 22, 1847, during the Battle of Buena Vista. Davis and less than 5,000 Americans would defend their positions near Puerto de la Angostura from over 15,000 Mexican troops. Despite being immensely outnumbered, it was an outstanding victory. During the fight, Davis was wounded in the foot. In recognition of the bravery shown by Jefferson Davis during the battle, of which the Mississippi Rifles played a key part, it's reputed that General Zachary Taylor said, My daughter, sis, was a better judge of men than I was. On May 17th, President Polk offered Davis a federal commission as a brigadier general in command of a militia brigade. Davis declined the appointment, stating, The Constitution of the United States designates the authority of the appointing militia officers to the states, not the federal government. Recognizing Davis's service after the war, Mississippi Governor Albert G. Brown appointed Jefferson to U.S. Senate seat. Senator Jesse Spaked, a Democrat, vacated the seat after he died in May of 1847. Davis took the seat December 5, 1847. The Mississippi legislature elected Davis to the seat in January 1848. During his first term, Davis became a regent of the Smithsonian Institution and served on the Committee on Military Affairs and the Library Committee. In 1848, Davis proposed an amendment to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. This treaty ended the Mexican-American War and would annex most of northwestern Mexico. On top of all the territory the United States would gain through the treaty, Davis wanted to add a lot of territory in the northeastern part of Mexico. The amendment failed. It was seen as a southern attempt at creating new states for expanding slavery. On territorial expansion, Davis spoke of Cuba, saying, It must be ours to increase the number of slaveholding constituencies. He was also concerned that the Spanish Empire had in Cuba such a close holding from which to threaten Florida. In 1849, a group of Cuban revolutionaries led by Venezuelan adventurer Narcisco Lopez attempted to enlist Davis to lead a filibuster expedition into Cuba. Militarily speaking, a filibuster expedition involves a foreign force entering into a conflict in support of revolutionaries without a formal sanctioning from that foreign force's government. They offered Davis $100,000 up front to lead the expedition and then another $100,000 upon the liberation of Cuba. That's equivalent to over $2 million today. Davis refused, saying it was inconsistent with his duties as a senator. When asked to recommend someone else to lead the expedition, Davis suggested Robert E. Lee, then an Army major, who also declined on grounds of his military duty. Davis was made chairman of the Committee on Military Affairs December 3, 1849, during the first session of the 31st Congress. He was elected to a full six-year Senate term, but did not complete that term before he resigned. He attempted a run for governor, but lost to fellow Senator Henry Foote by a total of 999 votes. Even though he was without an office, Davis continued his political activity. He took part in the state's rights convention and campaigned in numerous southern states for Democratic candidate for president Franklin Pierce. Pierce would win the election and installed Jefferson Davis as Secretary of War in 1853. As the new head of war, Davis began the Pacific Railroad Survey to determine possible routes for the Transcontinental Railroad. He advocated for the Gadsden Purchase, reason being that it would provide a more convenient southern route for a new railroad. He increased the size of the army from 11,000 to around 15,000 by adding four new regiments. He persuaded Congress to increase the salaries of military personnel, their first raise in 25 years. Based on his experience in Mexico, Davis began introducing rifles for general use. Davis was also responsible 
for the construction of the Washington Aqueduct and an expansion project on the U.S. Capitol. Davis got along well with President Franklin Pierce, but clashed regularly with Winfield Scott, the commanding general of the United States Army. In 1857, Pierce lost the Democratic nomination for re-election to James Buchanan. Davis's tenure as Secretary of War ended with Pierce. As a result, he ran for the Senate, winning and taking his seat back again March 4, 1857. It was in early 1858 when Jefferson Davis developed an illness, appearing first to be a severe cold. It would develop into something that threatened him with the loss of his left eye. He remained in a darkened room for four weeks. This affliction would remain with him for the rest of his life. Later, in 1858, Davis would give anti-secessionist speeches in Boston. He was a solid states' rights advocate and was not in favor of federal encroachment on states' issues. He did not support secession because, as former Secretary of War, knew the South lacked greatly in military and naval capabilities. Mississippi adopted an ordinance of secession on January 9, 1861. Davis expected this to occur. He waited until he received official notification before resigning his position in the United States Senate. On January 21st, he submitted his resignation, a day which Davis called the saddest day of my life. Given Davis's substantial military and political experiences, he fully expected to be utilized in the upcoming struggle for Southern independence. He wrote a letter to Mississippi Governor John J. Pettus saying, judge what Mississippi requires of me and place me accordingly. On the 23rd of January, Governor Pettus made Davis a Major General of the Army of Mississippi. On February 9th, the Constitutional Convention met at Montgomery, Alabama. The members considered both Jefferson Davis and Robert Toombs of Georgia as possible president. Davis had widespread support from six of the seven seceded states. The members saw him as a champion of the slave society and embodied the values of the planter class. The convention elected Davis provisional Confederate president by acclamation and inaugurated him February 18th, 1861. Alexander H. Stevens was chosen as vice president. He and Davis would feud constantly. Davis had hoped to be commander-in-chief of the Confederate armies, but said he would serve wherever directed. His wife later wrote this after Davis learned he would be president. Reading that telegram, he looked so grieved that I feared some evil had befallen our family. Jefferson Davis was the only president of the Confederate States of America. He had great experience in many different areas, but Davis had many faults of leadership, seen consistently throughout his term as president. He was unable to delegate authority and became preoccupied with details the president should not deal with. He did not promote Robert E. Lee to commander of the Confederate Army, believing it to be his role as the president. He lacked popular appeal and feuded regularly with state governors and generals. He played favoritism, protecting his old friends while being unable to get along with those he disagreed with. He neglected civil matters while consuming himself with military operations. His well-roundedness, as identified early in the war as a reason for selection in the first place, worked against him as he stretched himself beyond the limits of his capabilities. We will soon see the war test Jefferson Davis, but that is for another time. To follow Jefferson Davis's career as president of the CSA, be sure to subscribe to the show by clicking on the red subscribe button below. And to learn about the South seceded from the United States and put Jefferson as head of the new government, click here. Thanks for watching. See you next time.